Good evening, folks. We're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome to the Coffee Pot Fire Community Information Meeting for Sunday, August 18th. My name is Nathan Judy. I'm the Information Officer for California Interagency Incident Command Team 5. I'll be the facilitating tonight's meeting. Um, we want to thank you all for taking the time out to come to the meeting this evening. Um, you'll be hearing from members of the local agencies that are involved with this fire, the command team, and our cooperators this evening. After the formal presentation, uh, we will be taking the questions that were written in the back of the room. So if you did write on, uh, your questions on cards, please give those to the folks in the back of the room and we'll answer those at the end of the formal briefing itself. And the same thing with the ones that are online for folks that are watching on Facebook. Um, we would like to recognize in the room today, Sergeant Joshua Hauser. If you have any questions for him afterwards, everyone's gonna be around in the room afterwards at presentation so you can talk one-on-one. -on -one. We got a map on the wall here you can address as well. Come around and talk to us. We also want to um, welcome Jerry Olson, agency administrator from BLM. So same thing, at the, he'll be here at the end of the meeting if you guys have any questions for him as well. So currently the fire is at 221 acres. Um, we know it's growing. We'll do an IR flight later on and, and we'll... 621 is what we had this morning. Yeah, sorry. There you go. Dyslexia. <laughs> right, wouldn't that be great? No, it's, it's continuing to grow. But it is 0% contained, and we have 135 firefighters on this. We do have a lot more firefighters on order, and they are coming in at this time. And with that, I'd like to bring up Sequoia Kings Canyon National Parks Superintendent Clay Jordan. Uh, thanks, Nathan. I appreciate it. Well, good evening. Well, it's always a pleasure to have opportunities to meet with you all. I just don't like the excuses for bringing us uh, together. And so, you know, once again, we are in a situation with a, with a fire. And, um, and a couple of things are different from experiences from 2020, 2021. Number one, we don't have a fire looming over the community, you know, as we speak, posing any sort of a immediate threat. Number two, we don't have the extreme fire conditions that we had in 2020 and 2021. However, uh, we did, this is a, a lightning strike fire that occurred on August 3rd, and it caught our attention immediately and we're concerned about this, even though very far away, very small, and we want to tell you kind of that story. And we want to tell you the story of, of uh, how we've gotten to this point, what we've done, and then uh, and I, we're going to do that, and I'm going to invite uh, our fire management officer, Leif Matheson, to do that with me. So why don't you start working your way up, and we're going to tag team this and, and piggyback on this. And then we're going to transition to the incident management team five to talk about the future. So we're going to talk a little bit about the past and then transition over to the team that will talk about where we go, where we go from here. I also want to begin with, um, you know, it's not our first rodeo, uh, unfortunately, on this sort of thing. And so the agencies that are assembled in this room have worked very closely together uh, through some pretty dark days and tough times in the past, and we're able to really capitalize on those relationships and on that expertise and that local knowledge. And, and I really want to express how grateful we are to have the partners with, with the county um, and with uh, CAL FIRE uh, on this. And so that, that is uh, one of the, the good things uh, about all this. Um, so August 3rd, we had this lightning strike and um, even though it's small and it's one of eight, we've, we've had about eight lightning strikes around the park that we've been, been working with. This one is an area of concern because number one, it is in an area with extremely heavy fuels, very steep, rugged terrain, difficult to get to. And number two, there is not any real fire history between the fire and the community. And so we talk about uh, the need that we're, we're, we're in this boat of having these, some of these conflagration fires in California because we had a history for so many decades of putting out every single fire that came along. And we've had to try to stop that practice when we can 
This was not one of those times. And so from the first onset, we recognized that we had to go full aggressive suppression on this from the onset and to take this on. This was not the time or the place or the conditions you know, for those type of conditions. And so we've been very aggressive, and so we want to kind of talk through uh, what we've done and then as our lead-in into the future and what we might expect uh, with this fire that's going to be on the landscape for a while. Okay? So next, um, Leif, why don't you go ahead and kind of run through the timeline and some of our actions. Well, good evening. My name is Leif Matheson. I'm the fire management officer here in the park. Uh, and I'll just, like Clay had already mentioned, I'll just talk through what's, what, uh, basically from the origins to where we are today. So uh, Saturday, August 3rd, I was driving to Visalia at about 8.30 in the morning doing some grocery shopping. I got a phone call from my deputy fire management officer. He sent me a picture of this thin little column of smoke up off uh, Salt Creek Ridge. He said, we've got a fire. It's not in a good location. I'm launching a helicopter. I said, Christian, I support that. There are no options off the table. If you need retardant, let's get it flying. The helicopter started uh, making bucket drops. It's got about 150 gallons per drop. It did one fuel cycle, so look at about 10, 10 buckets. Uh, so a little over 1,500 gallons of fuel. Uh, water on the fire. They did a load and return, put another uh, cycle of buckets on that fire, had it uh, mitigated to the point where we could stop flying and tr try to start inserting crews. Uh, we were going to uh, try to short haul some folks in to get a hell of a spot. So we, can, we don't repel, but we can short haul folks in. There's an attachment that goes to the bottom of the helicopter to do that, and there was a mechanical issue with that attachment. So we started to drive folks up Case Mountain, which is a complex system of roads and gates, and we got folks finally up there towards the end of the afternoon. It was a little too late to, uh, to dr hike in, put another load of buckets on it, and we were feeling pretty good in the morning that we could get into that fire with the folks that we had. They knew the route then. They had kind of had uh, looked at it across the ridge line and felt like they could get in there. The following morning, got in there, crew started driving up, got the helicopter up again, put two more cycles of buckets on it as the crews were hiking in, because they were going to have to hike downhill to it, and they wanted to make sure it was pretty parked there. About 1100 that day on Sunday, 11 in the morning, first firefighters touched the edge of that fire. They did an assessment of it. They felt pretty good with what they had, and they started to take action. Um, about an hour on scene, the um, the strike tree, the, the tree that was initially struck by lightning, fell down, and we were feeling pretty good, like, okay, that tree's on the ground, and they started to build, build line around it. Christian uh, reinforced to them that they needed to make sure that that was you know, pretty well secured. They stayed just up the ridge. They spiked out on that fire that night, and next morning they went in, so that gets us to about the fifth. By the end of the, the, the fifth, they were feeling pretty good about it, Christian talked to him on the radio. You know, we need to make sure this thing's parked. Um, they were pretty confident that the edge was secure. Uh, there were no smoke showing, and they uh, hiked out. Um, on the 6th through the 10th, we continued to monitor that fire from air, make sure we don't see any smokes. We knew we had a route in. Um, and on the 11th, uh, at about the afternoon, they, there was a heat signature that showed up on the IR, and Christian said, you know what? Uh, that's not in a good spot, got air attack up, and it was about four acres. And that was in that evening, they started flying air tankers on it that evening of the, um, the 11th was what we call the rollout day. That's when it, it rolled out. And the following morning, <clears throat> flew air tankers on it again. We put uh, crew, uh, crew, uh, crew orders in, so just some, not to go down too far of a side trail, but right now we're nationally in planning level five, which is the highest planning level you can get, and we're really resource depleted. Our hotshot crew here in the park had an order to Oregon, and Christian worked on the phone with talking with our South Ops and said, look, we have this fire, we need this crew. They turned wheels and came to our, our fire. So we were able to keep them on fire, which is a, uh, it seems like it would be a no-brainer, but in this environment where we are with the PLs, it, it wasn't. We got our crew here, placed another order for another hotshot crew, got two hotshot crews on the fire within two days. They started to cut line and they were feeling good, like they were making progress. The fire was 10 acres. They had a pretty good anchor on it. Um, you can't be in there at night with the snag load and the way things are burning down. Uh, they would back off to a spike camp at night. They camped up on Case Mountain to uh, really uh, shorten the time it took to get in there. 
And at night, between midnight and three in the morning, the crews reported the, crew, the fire got really active, so it was likely in a thermal belt, uh, an area of warm air at night. <clears throat> they expected, based on that activity, that when they got in there in the morning, it would probably have rolled over the line. And they hiked in in the morning and found that. <clears throat> so got two crews in there now. They're cutting line. Same thing, they're feeling pretty good at the end of the shift. Uh, about midnight to three, the fire's super active. Third day, we got another third crew in there, so we got about 60, 60 people on this fire, <clears throat> sitting at about 20 acres, and the, got a good anchor on it, and uh, that third night was the most active night, and I think in the morning it was about 50 acres, and we realized that we weren't going to be able to pick this up with three crews going direct on the fire line, the snag load, the fuels, the resistance to control, it's not slowing down at night with increasing RHs, the, the fuel size isn't, isn't receptive to taking on moisture from the relative humidity. So um, uh, at that point, when we started to go from our direct strategy right on the fire's edge, to an indirect strategy, meaning that the fire was going to get larger because we had to come out to advantageous uh, terrain features. We started to make some decisions about the management organization that it was going to take to manage that. In-house, we didn't have the capacity to support 100 people on the fire line with logistics and sleeping and all that other stuff. Um, we initially ordered a type three incident management organization. And then uh, within a few hours pivoted to the complex incident management team that uh, took the fire this morning. And uh, that's, that's about it. Yeah, so just a couple of things I wanna underscore uh, as we move this along. Um, number one is that um, we talked about it was our problem that we ran into in the KMP complex too. Sometimes the terrain is just too steep and too rugged to be effective. Uh, in a direct at attack. This one was kind of marginal. Our, our guys recognized, I don't know, but, but we can give it a good shot. We've, we've, we've got folks, and so we, they, with, even with the heavy load of crews and hotshot crews um, and the really heavy air ops. I mean, if you were in a viewpoint, you saw the heavy air show, and this is with a lot of fire activity across the West. So we got more than our lion's share of resources on this really small, remote, non-threatening fire uh, and really hit it really hard. Um, but when we recognized that direct attack, just like in KMP, is not gonna be effective way to go after this fire, it means then dropping back to indirect. When we do that, because there's not any natural barriers up there for a long way from that fire, it meant that uh, we're looking at a very big containment box um, in order to contain that. So the fire is going to get a lot bigger you know, before it is contained, before the fire gets to terrain that is defensible and we can, we can then effectively stop the spread of the fire. When recognizing that we're going to an indirect to, with a big box, it meant that we're gonna need a lot of resources on this fire, the logistics were gonna be tricky, uh, and it certainly exceeded what we had available in the local communities, and that's when we pushed the button for the complex incident management team. Um, and so they are now in a position to assist us and work with this thing as, as the fire grows, as, uh, as we expect, and, and know where it's going to grow to and where we're going to uh, try to contain all that. Uh, but that means a lot of resources, a lot of firefighters descending on the community, and this fire is going to be on the landscape um, for a while. The other thing that our fire folks did was very early on engaged our partners with CAL FIRE right there on our side, with uh, Tulare County Fire right there uh, at our side, and, and working together, looking at the maps, you know, where, when can we help, where can we help, um, and, and work on this as a community uh, a puzzle as, as we've done in the past. And with that in mind, I think I uh, want to turn it over to our local cooperators um, to just talk about uh, where they're at and about any future involvement. And we're going to start with Chief, needs no introduction to this crowd, I know, but uh, Chief Charlie uh, Norman. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. 
Good evening, everybody. Notice I did the academy routine. I start sneaking up here, hopefully pick up on the queue and start exiting. Come on, that was funny. <laughs> it's good to see everyone. Um, a lot better conditions than we were here with the last with the KMP complex. Um, and I'm going to be very, very brief and just talk about our responsibilities and what we're going to do. And I'll, I'll stick around if you guys have any one on one questions for myself or my staff. Uh, Kevin Riggy, our division chief, he's assigned as our agency representative. I also have Chief Brian Duffy, who's on the South Fork right now, who's assigned as a group supervisor. Captain Franks, our local captain here at the Three River Station. And we have Supervisor Eddie Valero, who supports all of our operations. So. Um, we, we've done this before with the KNP, the Windy, the Cedar, the Pier. In the last eight year history, we've had some significant incidents in Tulare County from top to bottom of the county, just about all 4,400 square miles. Um, we've done a great job of working with our cooperators. Um, this is not a county incident, but as uh, Clayton talked about the big box, our job is structure defense, structure preparation within this big box, within these incidents. So we need to make sure that we're working with our cooperators to make sure it doesn't get to that point. Um, you're going to come up, and I have um, also Sergeant Hauser and Sergeant Stark here, who you, everybody knows here, that will be working on any type of evacuation warnings, orders that we have. Um, the fire looks good at this point. Again, a slow moving, not anything that we had in the KMP complex, but uh, it's uh, we want everybody to be prepared. So we can, the evacuation notice, make sure that you do have something ready to go, make sure you're packed up, and uh, valuables, medicines, so on and so forth, pets, uh, logistical arrangements. And we will communicate with you. I, I'd like to say, hey, there's nothing to worry about, but we could leave here, we could have a wind change, and things could change, the conditions could change rapidly. So, and we're only at about 621, 700, about 620 acres. So um, we've got a lot of work to do, um, but we are here to support all the local operations with perimeter control, structure defense, and we will have, we have uh, resources on standby. We do have a type three strike team that's ready to go to plug in in the incident at any time. So it's, and, um, with all due respect to everybody in this industry, we all want the same thing. We want everything to be safe, but I'm going to be here as representative of this county when the incident management team goes home. So I just want you to know that. No, no slam against anybody. Everybody acts like it's their own dirt, but we just want to make sure that everybody knows me by Charlie, not Chief. So um, I'll answer any questions. My staff's back there to answer any questions. And that was a lot shorter than Clay, huh? I'd like to introduce Ryan Pack, Deputy Chief with CAL FIRE. Ryan? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Norman. I, I just wanted to reiterate the cooperation between the agency has never been stronger. This isn't the first time we've done this. Um, our involvement right now is a contingency portion of the incident. So what we're doing is we're using heavy equipment to open up lines around protecting the community of Three Rivers. Uh, we've done this. This will be the third time in the last five years. So we're quite uh, familiar with what we're doing up there. Uh, our also in our family is the what we call direct protection acres and uh, if you look at the map up here the SRA is what Cal Fire usually protects that's what our authority is to protect but we have traded uh, with the Bureau of Land Management so our interest at this point is protecting the interests of the Bureau of Land Management and some of that is the redwood grows up there so we're doing what we can do to help them protect their interests, as well as was the fire moves south, that's when it's going to be uh, where the uh, private lands come into uh, uh, on the radar for us. So as it gets closer to the private lands, you'll see more of a influx of resources from the state. Uh, there should be no lag time. We basically have stuff already preloaded. So I want to rest assured that um, that people feel safe and then we have a plan. This incident management team has a very solid plan. We support it very great, uh, greatly. Any questions after this, I'll be here to, uh, in the back of the room. Other than that, uh, it's good to see some faces in the crowd. Hi, Ms. Terry Hiltel, Mr. Hiltel. <laughs> so uh, anyhow, thank you. And I'm gonna introduce uh, Operations Section Chief uh, Ernie Villa. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And so if we could zoom out the map a little bit, and I'll probably go over here to the other side of the map here real quick, make it a little easier. <clears throat> and so uh, they talk pretty good about how the fire is currently behaving. It's pretty much backing at this point. The fire activity, I would characterize it as uh, 
pretty low to moderate. Uh, it's, we've seen some single tree torching, uh, maybe group tree, but for the most part, the fire is burning pretty much on the ground of the uh, forest. And as it does that, it's kind of cleaning up all the dead and down fuels. Um, like Chief Norman said, we're not keeping, uh, we're gonna keep our eyes on it. It can change if the weather changes and things can get in alignment with these drainages and the winds and it does have potential to make large runs. Uh, so currently kind of what we're looking at is uh, this ground's pretty unforgiving. Um, there's not a lot of access into this ground as you move more to the east out towards Homer's Nose, as many of you may be familiar, but um, we're looking at this ridge line that comes up here out of South Fork, comes up to the top to Salt Creek Ridge. Uh, this is where the crews were making access coming out to the main fire's edge. It's about an hour walk for the, when the road ends out to the main fire's edge. Uh, like they articulated earlier, it's pretty tough ground to try to fight fire where they talked about going direct along the fire's edge due to the amount of dead trees and things that are out there that are hazards to the firefighters. Uh, we prioritized the operation based on uh, firefighter safety, life property, and then natural resources that are being threatened at that point. So currently right now, the main threats to natural resources, which are these giant sequoia groves that are highlighted in the darker shades of gray, and then our firefighters that are actually physically out here. Their uh, egress in and out of the fire is basically a road system that comes out here that's really long and windy, narrow, so trying to make sure that we have a clear path for them to get up and down out of the fire. Currently, that's not being threatened as the fire is backing towards that area, but over time it could change. But uh, so operationally, we've got equipment, crews, and dozers down here in the bottom. We uh, flew the fire, we're looking at some dozer line that comes up this small little ridge here. And then uh, there'll be hand crew and dozer line intermix it coming all the way to the top. This upper section right here is pretty rugged. We got some of our most talented hand crews between uh, state and federal resources. And we're gonna look at trying to put a uh, hand line along that ridge line. We have enough time, the fire's not forcing us. It's moving pretty slow, so we'll be able to look at putting that line in. And then we're looking at ridge lines scouting out this way, out towards Mineral King Road. There aren't a lot of options. A lot of these ridge lines don't have a direct path all the way down to something that we can hold or control it. So it's gonna be a little challenging as we continue to go down that way out to the north to make that happen. Yep, it's basically this uh, South Fork Drive. Could you zoom out a little bit? Uh, South Fork Drive is basically this lower road right here. And then if you go to the north here, uh, Mineral King will be out here. It'll parallel it. And so, yep, so it ends right about here. I got a glare on the map. And then Ladybug Trail takes off right here. Ladybug Trail. <laughs> We are, we're using the Cinnamon Gap Road as kind of our access into the fire currently. Um, it is in areas, we have some challenges with passing that road, just some of the storm damage. So we're working to identify those areas and continue to make it better for our access. Uh, so we're looking at options out here. Uh, currently with the giant sequoia groves, we have, uh, we're building plans to do uh, tactical ignitions, basically lighting the top of the grove and allowing fire to back through it so the fire doesn't make aggressive runs up to it. The surprise grove right here, we flew it earlier, fire's backing through it pretty evenly and it's not doing any damage. Uh, we do have a plan to maybe do some aerial ignition out here just to keep the fire backing. That way this lower fire uh, edge of fire doesn't get into the draw here and make a run up to it. The fuels are pretty heavy down there so we think that'll be uh, more advantageous than having the fire run from the bottom up to the top of the hill. Uh, overall, we have a lot of people around the fire looking at different options of where we can go and validating that. It's easy to look at a map and pick ridge lines. When you go out there, it's a little bit more challenging because of all the fuel loading. Uh, they talk to how uh, absent of fire this area has been. There's not a lot of fire history, so we don't have a lot of options to run the fire into for stopping it. Uh, we do have the K&P fire here on the south end, so we'll look at options at maybe getting it out to that area where we can slow it down and use aircraft. So. We have a whole suite of resources available to us and we'll continue to deploy them as we see fit and we can do safely. So right now it's about safety, not getting anybody hurt and then also paying attention to our values at risk, working with our cooperators. And we'll make sure that if we have to have a need for evacuations, it's very strategic and we're not uh, making uh, any moves without making sure we're making the right move and not uh, making sure we're not putting you out of your homes sooner than we need to, so thank you. Next up will be uh, Dustin Mueller, Incident Commander.
Thank you, Ernie. Hi, once again, Dustin Mueller, Incident Command Team 5. Um, so, uh, speaking to you guys, I want to give you a couple, some updated facts uh, we just released at 1800. Uh, with, so the current size of the fire is 733 acres. They just flew that with infrared aircraft. So not a big gain today from 621 that uh, uh, the PIO stated. Updated also is 342 current firefighters on the ground. So that's up there on the, on the hillside. Uh, we just placed an order for uh, five um, additional hotshot crews and uh, five additional type two or type two IA crews. And we have engines, um, we have four uh, strike teams of four service engines. Um, the local Tulare County um, strike team and a lot of uh, Cal Fire contingent ready to come in as well. We're trying to set up base camp. We haven't got feeding yet, but we are uh, trying, trying to set that up somewhere down uh, closer to the valley where there's communications and we could house all the firefighters uh, after their shift. So that's what we're kind of doing forward. Um, like I said, it's our first day in command. Um, what I, what I kind of give out with leader's intent here is when I started with the team, we come with a team of about 150 folks scattered throughout California. Um, you know, a uh, array of experience from public information, food people, um, operational people, um, logistics, um, liaisons who, who help us uh, with the local communities, everything else. So we have all those folks down in, in the valley right now and then up on the mountain as well. So we're spread out. So my leader's intent th to them, and, and I got this from uh, the superintendent, was aggressive uh, full suppression strategy. And what that means is we are going to go after this one and we're going to do everything. So what we did was a risk assessment, um, basically with what you guys saw with, you guys heard firefighter safety, right? But we, we did a risk assessment and this, this incident proves that we are risking some lives or risking um, firefighter injuries to go after this fire because of the values at risk, which that includes our number one, my number one priority is the communities. So that includes, includes the uh, South, South Fork Road, um, Three Rivers and stuff like that. So th that is our community, like what Ernie said was um, the Sequoia Groves is right now, that's what our hands being pushed, but we have the talent and the horsepower right now to go after two of those priorities, which is the Groves, Sequoia Groves and the communities to protect those and lock those off. What, but like um, the superintendent stated with um, the fire gonna get larger and that's that indirect strategy and those are those ridges that we could pull it down to the, wa um, to the river down there. <clears throat> so just, I did want to talk about uh, how we get to the uh, risk assessment and what, where, you know, where the values at risk are. So we have a thing called incident strategic alignment process. We're going to start that tomorrow on our second day where we, where all the cooperating agencies, Tulare County, Tulare County Sheriff, Cal Fire, Park Service, BLM, we all sit in a room and we put all the values on, on, the, on the basically a whiteboard and then I let the leads of those agencies tell me what means what to them. And then what we'll do is um, talk about what we're going to do and where we're going to put those resources, communities, square groves, um, natural resources, and so on. So that's, that's starting to take off. Um, we know right now immediately it's where Ernie pointed out those primary lines right now on, on the west and the, to the northwest. So that's what we're going to kind of work. So <clears throat> with that, I really want to give a shout out to um, the community for welcoming us in. And if you guys have any problems with us driving through town too fast, we're, you know, <laughs> We are going, please let me know. Please let um, the Tulare County Sheriff know, let the Park Service know, because uh, we value communities. Um, you, the Park Superintendent will know how to get a hold of me, so please let us know. <laughs> um, so the partnership here is really, um, as we fight fires in many different states, we just got back from Oregon. Um, we're on a, a pretty complex fire up there. But what we, complex incident management might be a new term this year to you guys, but we're an old type one team. We've been a type one team for a long time. Um, this fire is currently rated at a type two complexity. So that's kind of a moderate complexity, but it has potential to get bigger and more complex. So that's where we're sitting. The, the, the national office, they, they switched to one term complex incident management team, and that's kind of where they redubbed us. So we're an old type one team from California. We have a lot of experience here. We've been on a lot of the fires that, uh, um, the chief um, recognized earlier, Wendy and uh, Pierre. Those were the two recent ones in the area that we've been on. So with that, I'd like to thank all our partners, especially CAL FIRE. They're helping us out a lot with the radio systems, all their support, their heavy equipment support down there and their DPA. Uh, re really appreciate that. Tula Tulare County Sheriff, Tulare County Fire. Um, we're gonna start negotiations and conversations with them and how they impact and how they could help us um, protect your guys' community more, and we're going to support them to the full um, extent possible. 
Thank you, and I'll be available for questions as well. Looking at my public information officer, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin. Appreciate that. And if you do have uh, comments, concerns, we do have on the updates. There's an email. You can email us. There's also a phone number there. You can give us a call. So if you've got folks speeding through your town, we also have our PIOs in the back of the room. They're going to be in your town as well, posted up at information boards, letting you folks know what's going on with the fire. They'll have the daily updates and they'll be posting those board daily as well. So that concludes the formal portion of the presentation itself. Um, we'll go into questions and answers next. So one of the, some of the cards that you guys had written and given us to the back of the room, I'm going to bring up Ernie Villa. He has a couple of questions. Okay, uh, the first question was, uh, what is the plan for Mineral King Road and those communities? So currently, uh, the fire is not imminently threatened, the, that Mineral King Road, but as it gets closer to that point, we'll identify an area that we're going to provide a recommendation to the sheriff's office and the county cooperators to shut that road down, possibly. And why we do that is so that we can get fire apparatus in and out of that area. It's not to limit your access, but it's more for safety for all of us. A lot of you probably know that the Mineral King Road's pretty narrow, and I know that uh, we're, you're concerned about our speeds driving, but I've seen, uh, I've been up there recently, and there's a lot of traffic flowing through there pretty fast. We will probably have signs out there. You'll be fair warned as far as when that will come to, at a point where the fire makes, uh, gets close enough to where we have to make that recommendation for the closure, but for the most part, we'll allow as much access as we can around the fire up in the cinnamon gap roads and areas like that we ask that you try to stay out of there because it's pretty narrow we have a lot of fire equipment coming out of there in and out of there also on the south fork drive road on the very east end of that we're going to have a lot of heavy equipment and crews and we're already having a hard time finding parking areas so that's kind of our plan any areas that we plan to have limit access to the public or we ask for a possible recommendation for an evacuation goes through a, a process and it, we, re we provide those recommendations through our cooperators that have that jurisdiction to make those calls. It's very strategic. It's very planned out. We want to make sure if we're making that decision, it's the right call. We know what it's like to have people out of their homes and what, that, what that's like. So uh, next question. <clears throat> How big must the fire grow before it reaches uh, effective containment? Generally, containment on a fire is uh, identified as a black line around a red area on a map, as you can see. Um, we don't have that because we're not able to get to the fire's edge. As soon as we're able, able to get to the fire's edge or the fire makes it to one of our containment lines that we've identified and we feel comfortable the fire is going to hold to a certain point where we're going to hold it on there, we'll work, we'll work with our team to make sure that we call that contained. So that's how it's kind of driven. It's not so much on the fire size. It's more of when the fire's at a point where we've identified on the map that we can hold the fire. So right now where the fire is currently sitting, there's not a viable option for us to go direct after it just because of safety concerns and how steep the ground is. The ground's very impenetrable. It's very rugged. And uh, the lines that we've chosen are uh, first point that we're going to look at trying to stop the fire. And then we also have other lines that are even further west and north and to the south of that that are from some from K&P. We're going to be looking at opening all those lines as well. So we have multiple options. Our primary option will try to get as close as we can safely to this fire. And where we're at currently is pretty uh, steep and rugged, but we got the right equipment in there. And as we start building our other assets that allow us uh, medical to allow us to extract our firefighters, should they get hurt, we'll continue to push that plan forward. So. Yep. Yep. Rivers, roads, ridges. Yes. Yep. Thank you. I appreciate that. So one of the questions that did come in was about air quality. Um, we did order an air quality advisor. Um, that folks are going to be showing up. But if people ha did have some questions about air quality, there's a website called Air Now. If you go to the Air Now website, you'll be able to find out the current air quality for the area that you live in. You put in your uh, zip code in there, it tells you exactly what the air quality is at that time. 
circle circuit. Depends on a, you know, how much uh, bandwidth you might have. But we'll, we'll I'll take a look at it. And I don't run it, but that's the best one we have right now. Until we can get a air quality advisor in here, what they'll do is they'll run a report, and you'll see that report posted um, on the boards themselves and also on NC Web. Next, we're going to bring up um, the fire management officer from the park. Got some more for Ernie? All right, Ernie, you got some more. I'm truly here to answer a lot of the questions operationally you guys have. I'm, I'm, I'm very open to just trying to be transparent with you. So it's a question about uh, work possibly going on in Grouse Valley. Um, so that area is south of the fire. I'm, uh, I'm originally the district FMO over there. I'm detailed in Northern California. It's not an area we identified as being a current threat right now where the fire is at. So if it were to get closer to South Fork, it would be an area I would identify and try to get resources to go up there and start doing work. It's so far away from the fire currently. Uh, we are utilizing the pond up there that's up in Grouse Valley for water source. To, uh, it's about six mile flight across to the fire. So we are using the water out of the pond, but we don't see the need currently to do any like operational groundwork in that area. So it's basically a question about uh, indirect attack will allow it to grow. What acreage will the need be to reach containment? So I kind of thought I hit on that a little bit. And uh, so containment's hit when we can stop the fire. If we stop the forward rate of spread of this fire, that's where we're going to show containment pretty much. We're not at that point. The fire's pretty uh, impenetrable. That ground's pretty rugged. Um, we'll try to get photos back to our PO, PIO shop just to kind of show you kind of what we're dealing with. I can tell you if anybody's hiked up to Homer's nose, it's pretty rugged. We have some of our most talented, sure-footed people out there, and when they're telling me that they can't make it there, I, I trust what they're telling us. And uh, it's not a viable option where we could try to hold a fire or put a line in, hold the fire, and try to keep firefighters safe. So we're going to be out on ridge lines where we feel like we have a chance to stop the fire, but we also can provide for their safety. So it's kind of the combination of the two. Where we're at the closest opportunity, at least on the west side of the fire, where we can truly stop it. We have other lines identified. They go further west. You end up in a lighter fuel type back in grass and stuff. So we have a favorable way to stop the fire, but we also want to take consideration for the lands that we could prevent from burning up if we can get a little closer. So containment's reached when we get to a point where we stop the forward rate of spread. We're able to put uh, efforts into mopping up and securing the edge, and we can call it contained. So it's not really based on the size of the fire. It's more of how much effort we put into a, a specific piece of the line. Do you know why the South Fork is... I can't read that part so low. Are you using firefighting? So we are, we've identified the South Fork. We're aware of all the structures and stuff that are along South Fork. Our highest priority is to provide the protection for the, all of those houses along South Fork. We're gonna keep the fire as high up on the hill away from the homes as we can. And we're gonna make sure that if we provide a recommendation for a closure, it's the closest to your house that we can feel that you could be in there safely. So we're aware of all that. The fire's a ways away from that area, and we'll continue to work with our cooperators to provide those recommendations when we feel that time's right, to allow you all enough time, if you live in that area, to evacuate safely. Uh, those areas generally go from a warning, which is, a, hey, be ready, to an order, which is uh, basically you gotta leave. So there's a lot of fair warning that goes into that, and we'll make sure we give you guys fair notice. We're not there yet, but I think it could be, But we're going to continue to provide as uh, much re firefighting resources as we can in that area. So be patient with all the crews and stuff coming through that South Fork Road there, especially at the end. We're having a lot of parking issues, so be patient with us. We're there to also do a good job for you, but please kind of just allow us the right of way to kind of get in there and do our job. So thank you. We're gonna keep it to the north of South Fork Drive, up high as up on the hill as we can. So if we get down lower, a lot of you are familiar up there, it turns into like a grass fuel type. Once we get into grass, our aircraft are more efficient than where it's burning now in heavier fuel. Those trees and logs and how they talked about when this fire was small and they had a tree fall out, that's what we're dealing with because of how steep it is. If we get lower in the grass, it's a little bit easier firefight 
than where it's at currently. So as it gets down lower, or we have a lot favorable conditions, the fuel type changes into brush and grass. We have different tools in our arsenal that are more efficient in that fuel type. We can get in there a little easier. It's gentler ground. It's a lot more favorable opportunities in there for us to stop it. So. <laughs> I'm gonna try my hardest to keep this fire as small as possible for all of you. <laughs> Thank you. And the reason that we're not taking questions from the audience right now is we got folks online watching. So we're gonna be able to talk afterwards with folks. So that's why we asked for the cards. Um, we do have a couple more questions for the superintendent. Okay, I knew this question was coming. What does it close Mineral King Road mean? And what that, does that look like? That's a really good question and it's really nuanced and we're gonna look at this very closely. If you know me, I don't like closures. And, and, um, and as they talked about before, we're gonna do our best for firefighters and community to kind of coexist and work around each other, hopefully with a lot of cooperation uh, conservative driving on the road, we can try to deconflict some of those pressures that would would kind of push that that closure. Um, we may do this in stages. There could be that we close off for general public access, but maintain access for residents. Uh, there could be um, very concerned about the Silver City Resort, and you know they had a tough season last year. And so we're, we're really, that threshold is pretty high in my mind before I, I sign off on, on a closure there. But the reality is that this fire is gonna come down to the East Fork at some point, logically, in all likelihood. And so that's pretty close to, to the road. I am very glad that they, with the KMP complex, there is some a lot of black along from the from the river up to the road and up to the community. So that gives some good protection, gives some buffer there. And so Mineral King is sitting a whole lot better than than what we were talking about a few years ago. So I'm not terribly concerned at at this point about the safety of, uh, of the community. But we are going to have to figure out how we can best deconflict traffic on that road and working with fire operations. And we'll work closely with the Sheriff's Department, great partners, we'll work closely with Tulare County Fire Department and with the uh, Team 5 and CAL FIRE and we'll kind of uh, get to that decision and we'll try to put that off as, as best we can. But I would expect that there are gonna be some closure impacts at some point to Mineral King. I did sign yesterday a closure for uh, the South Fork Trailhead and, and into the back country there, up towards Hockett Plateau. You can still come in from Mineral King, but we have closed off uh, a sizable area there. But Mineral King, we're going to try to keep that active for everybody as long as we reasonably can for everybody's safety. Thank you so much for that answer. And we got one more for Ernie. So the question's uh, pretty much asking about water tenders and if we'll use them and if places where we grab water, we probably will. We probably will. Uh, we're looking at every opportunity to draw water out of every creek, stream, and pond out here. And uh, if it is on your property, we have a, a team of people that will probably reach out to you and try to negotiate use of that water. Um, if it's on our federal land, we'll be using it. And then you've probably seen helicopters on the South Fork Drive flying over pretty extensively. We're looking for sources where there's enough water in the mainstream there to, to pull water out of. So we have a, a different variety of helicopter sizes. So some of them will probably be dipping out of Quia Lake coming all the way up, and then the rest of them will be uh, looking for closer water sources a little bit closer, so. All right, thank you, Ernie, appreciate that, and thank you all for coming again this evening. Uh, that'll conclude the formal portion and the question and answer portion of the session tonight. So thank you folks online, thank you everybody in the room. We'll still be around here to talk to you afterwards for conversations, appreciate it. Thank you.